and welcome to the Gnostic Quran channel, where we explore the connections between Islamic and Gnostic theology. We're delighted to have distinguished guest Robert Price, a renowned biblical scholar today with us to discuss the intriguing topic of Zoroastrian influence on Abrahamic religious tradition. And welcome back to the channel. Oh, it's great to be here. What a privilege. Thank you. And uh, my first question uh, would be about the direct influence, maybe, of Zoroastrianism on Abrahamic faith. Did Zoroastrianism influence Abrahamic faith, or the similarities are purely coincidental? For example, does the concept of the battle between good and evil in Zoroastrianism and Abrahamic religious tradition could demonstrate a direct influence because for for me especially I, I often find two sides of the debate in the manichaean studies the first one without any hesitation will say that dualistic notions are straight away from zoroastrian mythology battle between armist or ahura mazda and ahriman who is identified with a lie druge on the mm. other side there is another part of debate which says that this dualism might be stemming from some apocryphal Jewish and Mesopotamian literature. And which side would you show yourself on? Well, I uh, I hate to say this, I think it's a bit of both, uh, because I'm thinking of a monograph by, uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, uh, Geo Wiedengren, a uh, great uh, Swedish comparative religion and history of religion scholar, uh, he has a, a book that I've uh, learned a lot from called uh, Mesopotamian Elements in Manichaeanism. And uh, he really, uh, I think, secures the debated point of whether there was pre-Christian Gnosticism, including the idea of the redeemed redeemer. And uh, I think he points out a lot of evidence that just is ignored, I, I assume, by people that are ignorant of it and, and not really aware of his work, though that's hard to imagine. But uh, so I think you, you can find uh, Mesopotamian um, um, influence in there. But I also think there's a lot of reason to believe that um, that uh, post-exilic Judaism was reformulated in Zoroastrian terms. You can never be sure of these things unless some even more miraculously explicit discovery is made, but uh, there are, and, and one problem here is it's notoriously difficult to date Zoroastrian scripture sources. Uh, so you have to just sort of try to plot them out on a line that seems to be uh, to make sense in development. And it, it seems to me that uh, it with the uh, in the Old Testament, you don't have uh, many of the cardinal points of rabbinic Judaism even in seed form until after the exile. Uh, when um, Cyrus uh, allowed uh, Jewish leaders to go back, and even the way the the books of Ezra and Nehemiah put it, they give the impression that the the Jewish leaders put in charge of this this uh, recreation, uh, this reinstatement of of the religion of the conquered people, uh, the religion of Jews. Um, was uh, th those people in charge, though Jews were officials in the uh, in the Zor in the uh, Persian government, and um, they uh, it says uh, that uh, Ezra came back to Palestine with the law of God in his hand, and then he has all kinds of trouble. He and Nehemiah do with the the Jews in the Holy Land who had not gone to Babylon for the exile, because certainly you know, most of them didn't. They just took the priestly aristocracy and the, the secular rulers away. And the, But the, the returning uh, people, the exilarchs, I guess they called them, uh, they, um, they had a lot of trouble getting the, uh, their, their countrymen 
to fall in line. And they, the, the latter seem to resent the haughty take charge attitude of those who came back from uh, Babylon under Persian auspices. And, uh, and then you, you compare the theology of, uh, of uh, Israel or Judaism before and after the exile, and you think, well, um, where did the idea of the resurrection of the dead come from? It, it certainly was not the uh, standard pre-exilic Jewish view. Uh, there you had uh, uh, Sheol, which was the, the pit, the, the grave, which sometimes appears simply to be a kind of m metaphor for just being dead, like in Genesis 3, um, from dust you came to dust you shall return. Or sometimes it seems to be a kind of ghostly realm of shadows, as in the Gilgamesh epic, uh, a great walled city uh, that uh, where where the 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 shades of the dead stumble around in darkness, unaware of God, and He's unaware of them, gives them no thought, and uh, it, it's dreary. And once you go there, as Enkidu says to Gilgamesh, you're never getting out again. Uh, and so it's not a place of active torment, but it's just a kind of a of a eternal parking lot for, for lost souls or whatever. Where does resurrection come in? You, you do have stories about a very few saints like Enoch, Elijah, and possibly Moses. These guys go to heaven, but they don't do so after rising from the dead. They go to heaven instead of dying. And, of course, this goes back to the solar origin of all three characters. And it had to do with the sun rising to the zenith of the sky. But everybody else, you know, they had no, no hope of going to heaven to, to pal around with the deity. Uh, so whence this idea that, uh, no, no, at the end, there's going to be a final judgment. The dead will come back at least the righteous dead, maybe all of them. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, there's one obvious suspect. Since uh, Zoroastrianism taught that, uh, apparently the first to teach it, and you had Persian-affiliated Jewish scribes coming back to knock uh, Palestinian Judaism into shape, they, appar they apparently imposed Zoroastrianism on, uh, on the religion of Israel. And it's not just the resurrection, of course. There's the idea of the great benefactor, the Seoshians, however you pronounce that. I've never heard anybody else say it, so I don't know. Uh, he's this, this virgin-born um, savior who will uh, come at the end of the age having... Um, uh, being born by a virgin who, I guess, unwittingly bathes in a lake, which is a kind of a giant sperm bank that holds the sperm of Zoroaster still alive. And, and, and the more they elaborate this, there are, I think, 12 such Seoshians, one for each millennium, because, of, as you know, it's divided up into a kind of a dispensational sequence. Oh, wow. Um, Fascinating. I didn't know about the 12 Seoshians, to be honest. Yeah, just, you usually don't read that, but but I believe they eventually did. Uh, because it's just straight away to have a connection with uh, some... Sh uh, non-orthodox Shia Hadith tradition, where there's the idea of the 12 Mahdis. It's not just mm. one Mahdi. Mm. It's interesting. Ah, fascinating. I didn't know about that. Mm. I knew about the 12 Imams, but uh, not Mahdis. Wow. And I got to find out more about that. As you know, there is a famous movement nowadays is, uh, called Ahmadi Religion of Peace and mm. Light. And... Uh, not the Ahmadiyya, not the Pakistani Ahmadis, which arose oh. in a in a 20th century or, or late 19th century, mm. but the recent one, which is the mm. sort of a subsect of some Alawi tradition, but uh, 
Hmm. One point of this tradition is they have their own first messiah called Ahmad al-Hassan al-Yamani. And there was a whole sect uh, during the Iraqi war, the Shia non-Orthodox messianic movement called Jundus Sama, the warriors of heaven. And he was uh, the leader of this movement. Uh, it's, it's sort of a Frankist messianic idea that if you spread out the revolution across the globe, you will get acceleration of the upcoming of the Messiah. Huh. And nowadays it's rebranded by this title, Ahmadi Religion of Peace and Light. And current day leader is the second uh, Mahdi. Uh, I was Abbas Sadiq or some, something, Abdullah Hashim, one, one of his titles, and he claims to be successor of this first Iraqi dude. So they, wow. they up, upheld to this 12th Mahdi tradition. It's a, Fascinating. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but get, getting back to the... Yeah, I've heard also about this redeemed redeemer theory. And I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I read some article. And in this article, I saw kind of a criticism of this theory, meaning that this, this theory may, f may be found out only in Manichaeanism and not in all Gnostic traditions. And you see basically what, what is the, this big, because it's, it's less complicated on Manichaeanism. Manichaeanism and Manichaeanism Messiah is a threefold. There is a three, three part type distinction in the Messiah and one of this Messiah may be qualified as this redeemer, re redeemed redeemer, sort of a spirit or what is called Jesus Patibulis, uh, the suffering Jesus who represent the spirit crucified in the universe. And uh, by that, what I think what they meant by that is this divine sparks, uh, which represents the human beings entrapped in the universe, mm -hmm. are sort of a crucified, are put up into this filth of body, uh, mm -hmm. of the sarkoi. Uh, Mani himself uses the, this term inter interchangeably with the hile, the, or hule, right? It would be the correct pronunciation of the Greek word, which literally translated as the matter. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to connect all of that. Because I, I, I know myself a little bit about this post-exilic Judaism. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more to it. And by the way, what you just said about the crucified spirit, I think there's something like that among the Naasins. Uh, that they kind of spiritualized the whole thing, uh, kind of in the fashion that Immanuel Kant would do so many centuries later. Uh, but with the uh, the Zoroastrian influence, uh, you you also have the uh, what you mentioned the business the the du the uh, ethical dualism and cosmic dualism of uh, Horamazda and Ahriman. And it, there's, this is one of those places where there are different theories about whether there was some kind of overarching monotheism and that uh, Angra Mainyu and Ormuz were su twin sons of, uh, of Ahura Mazda uh, and were set against each other, or whether uh, that, whether that is... Um, whether originally it was the two of them uh, that uh, were, were opposed to one another and became aware of one another, and that's when the cosmic conflict began. And then, of course, Zervanism perhaps restored this original idea of a first principle over the other two. And and I, from what I gather, I certainly am no specialist on this. There's some doubt as to which stage <laughs> preceded which, but at any rate, uh, it sure looks like 
that uh, the idea of Satan becoming the enemy of God uh, was not an Old Testament concept, or I should say an ancient Israelite concept or whatever, uh, that, uh, that insofar as Satan is mentioned at all in the Old Testament, uh, it's it's not even a proper name. It's just Ha Satan, the adversary, and whose adversary? Not God's, because he appears as in Job to be one of the sons of God, whose special job is to patrol the earth and and see who is worth God's time. Uh, God says to uh, the Satan, "Well, you you've been on your uh, on your rounds. I see. Uh, you must have noticed my servant Job. This guy's perfect in every way. Uh, he never misses his prayers, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And uh, and the Satan says, "No, come on, don't be naive. Look at the fringe benefits you give to this guy. He'd be a fool not to kiss your." But, uh, and do what, what you're supposed to do. Uh, and he says, I bet if you stopped the gravy train, this guy would curse you to your face. And God says, uh, okay, you're on. Let's find out. And you know what happens, right? Well, what is he doing? Is he trying to get Job to curse God? No, he, he suspects that God is being made a fool of by this guy. I mean, obviously nobody's thinking of an omniscient deity here, right? Uh, and he wants to safeguard, or like uh, in Galatians or something, where it says God is not mocked. Well, that's what the Satan is trying to do, safeguard the honor of the Almighty. Same thing with David, uh, where um, it says in uh, Samuel that uh, uh, God tempted David, uh, gave him the suggestion to conduct a military census to see if he would just trust God or, or, or if he'd feel like, well, I, I better, you know, take care of myself here. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, that, uh, wouldn't you want to know that? Uh, and so God does test him, and he flunks the test. In Chronicles, it's, it's told again the same way, except that now it's the Satan who makes the suggestion to David. And it, that's though that looks like a contradiction. It's not, because the chronicler figured, well, if God wants to test somebody, he's got a guy that does that. That's what the Satan does. And uh, and then what about in, um, I guess it's uh, either Haggai or Zechariah, I think it's the latter. Uh, there's a candidate for the high priesthood named Joshua, and the uh, Satan appears before God in the temple and says, Look at this guy. He's corrupt. Are you, are you aware of his uh, rap sheet? Uh, and uh, and then the angel of Yahweh says to him, he's like the defense advocate, and he says um, uh, something about um, uh, may uh, God curse you or something. And, and God then uh, purifies Joshua and he's okay. He, he gets the job. So why is the Satan doing that? Well, because he says this man's unworthy. He's, he's a champion for God. And in fact, he continues that role in the New Testament, right? When he takes Jesus out to the desert, he says, if you're the son of God, well, you ought to be able to do this and that and the other thing to see if he'll fall for it. Because if he does, he's not worthy of his office. Uh, so, you know, he's not trying to get him to sin. He's trying to see if he will. And, uh, and of course, he passes with flying colors. At the Last Supper, what does uh, Jesus say to Peter? Uh, Simon, uh, the Satan has uh, demanded his right to sift you disciples like wheat. And you're not going to pass the test. But afterward, we turn again and strengthen your brothers. And there's more than that even. So originally, that was his job. But... Apparently, uh, some of the uh, the Jewish scribes who who liked Zoroastrianism said, "Hey, you know they've got a, an interesting solution to a problem we have. If God is Almighty uh, and His will is done, why is there so much evil in the world?" 
Yikes. Uh, what do we say about that? Well, they have, uh, they don't have that problem. Uh, they say that, that God has a real fight on his hands. He has an enemy who is virtually as powerful as he is. And he's responsible for all the bad stuff. Yes, that limits God. He's not exactly omniscient, but you know, let's wake up to reality. It can't be that his will is being done all the time. And besides, we are assured that in the end he'll win. But you and I better take part in the battle. Every good deed we do is a blow struck on behalf of Jehovah. Every bad deed you're collaborating with uh, Ahriman. Well, we, we nobody knows who he is. How about Satan? Uh, let's pin it on him. Uh, maybe he is trying to get people to sin. Of course, this doesn't really work because you still have to ask yourself, why did God allow this guy to go on a rampage? But still, you know, where did it come from? Well, that's one obvious place. It must have come from uh, Persian Zoroastrianism. And then mm. uh, on and on, the, the idea of guardian angels. Uh, if that uh, comes up twice in the New Testament, uh, where uh, Jesus says, uh, watch out that you don't uh, cause one of these little ones to stumble because their angels always uh, uh, behold the face of my father. Their angels? Yeah, guardian angels, like the, the Fravashis uh, in Zoroastrianism. And their spirit doubles of human beings, because in Acts, I love this story, uh, where um, he, Peter's on death row, and his, his fans are down the road in Mark's mother's house praying for his release. Well, uh, looks like they lucked out because an angel appears and, as you know, delivers Peter and he makes a beeline for Mark's mother's house and knocks on the door. The maid uh, opens it and says, it, it, oh my God, it's Peter. She's so overcome, she doesn't even let him in. She runs to the prayer circle and says, you're not going to believe this. It's Peter at the door. And they say, are you crazy? It must be his angel. In other words, he must be dead, and he's his ghost is saying farewell. It's it's so great that these pious devotees are praying all night, and it doesn't even occur to them that God might have answered their prayers. Anyway, uh, that doesn't make any sense unless his angel is him. Uh, a spirit double, and where would you get such an idea from Zoroastrians? I mean, it just seems so uh, so obvious to me. Uh, it, it might not be true, but it certainly seems there's no way to know. But it's obviously the most plausible way uh, to, to look at it. There were even some rabbis who thought that Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah, was Zoroaster. Uh, I, I rest my yeah. case. And you see the the ideas everywhere, basically, even after Plato, right? Uh, in Mandeanism, even though it would be suspicious to suggest that Mandeanism took it from Plato, the idea of the heavenly counterparts, what is called the demuta in Mandeanism, images, uh, because they believe that there is the whole world of the of the forms of sort mm. of a div div re really divine state of beings and we are in this world are just simply reflections of, of this mm. divine states and uh, you also mentioned the zurvanism and i myself think there is a good case uh, in some at least in some chapters or surahs in the quran where, where you can see that the god is almost uh, certainly ad identified with a time uh it's a sort of a time being hmm. and uh I, I don't know whether you know him the james howard john J johnson J johnston he's a great historian uh of antiquity especially of the B byzantineologists and also works with this field early islam or origins in islam and i remember in one of his interview he uh, was asked about this question, what type of a God uh, Quran portrays, and he answered that, yeah, there's certainly this idea of the fatalistic God. Uh, just 
from my mind as uh, because I'm doing translation of the surah uh, Waqiya, which roughly translated as the occurrence 56 chapter of the Quran, where you can see this kind of a trend. Like, haven't mm. you, Afaraito Matamnun, haven't you uh, thought uh, about the seed which you pour out? There, there is a sort of a strange connection in Arabic uh, between ejaculation and the thought process. It's basically mm. the, the, the same uh, verb is utilized. Wow. Um, meaning that uh, whether it's you who create the seed or we create the seed doesn't matter uh, we are already predestined for you death and uh, nothing uh, is gonna change that basically it's rough translation Hmm. So, and uh, question, of course, whether this, again, divine plural refers to the higher God or maybe to, to some other uh, beings in the Quran. That's a very controversial topic, I guess. But uh, wow, yeah, from from this idea of the Zulvanism, what I want to to say that hmm. that Ahriman and Aramist is basically the sons, two sons of the higher God Zulvan. And uh, th that you can pinpoint to the Hindu tradition, right? The idea of the sort of a great time or Mahakala. Mm -hmm. And uh, roughly, the, the, this two tradition, Kelavada uh, Hinduism and the Zurvanism, is developed roughly at the same period. So <laughs> maybe there was some, certainly, there was some trade connection between yeah. Iran, and, uh, Iran and India. Uh, but uh, again, getting back to the whole Sayoshans and the uh, end times, what, what is called the restoration of the universe, right? That uh, mm. the Sayosh Suyosh uh, is coming as a sort of a builder of the of the new world. He initiates the Frash Girt, Frash Okirezi, what was also called. Uh, the re renewal of the world, uh, and you see that in some Kabbalistic Judaism, or at least from one Jew I, I, I have a dialogue with, he has stated this is orthodox position, the idea of the tikkun alam, the mm. restoration of the world. It, it's roughly the same notion. And, uh, yeah, but you, you can build up the gene genealogy of this belief back to the Hinduism, right? The idea mm. of different kalpas, different eras or epochs mm. at, uh, at the end of the uh, Kali Yuga. Uh, the, the, there is sort of a similar messianic figure appears, the Kalki, who mm. initiates the Mahapralaya, the great uh, destruction or dissolution. Hmm. So I, I just myself ignorant about Middle Eastern and my, maybe there's somewhat similar ideas in ancient Egypt, but I, uh, I never heard about it. Do you know about something like that or? Um, well, I know that uh, in uh, Isaac Luria's Kabbalah, there's the idea of um, the the fall of the world had to do with the uh, the shattering of the the kelipoth or i don't know how to pronounce these things uh that uh, should have uh been uh light vessels crystalline vessels that would hold the light streaming out of the orifices of the the adam kadmon uh and uh which sounds a lot like philo uh, to me and um but the uh, it turned out the uh, the Kelipoth were not strong enough to contain the divine light and shattered and the um, 
and sort of settle to the bottom of what, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, um, and the sparks of the Shekinah of God were lost among the shards of the ruined uh, universe. And so the Adam, uh, the heavenly Adam was charged with regathering all the sparks, which he did. But at the last moment, somehow, I forget that tripped, dropped the thing, and, and the, the sparks were scattered again, whereupon he was reduced in size and clothed in flesh, uh, a la Genesis. And, and, what, uh, and so that God, like his people, is in exile in the world, uh, an amazingly profound uh, piece of theology or mythology, uh, and uh, to extricate the sparks of light, uh, the the faithful Jew must um, undertake the series of devotions called tikkun, uh, purifying uh, actions. And uh, if enough do enough of it, uh, this will extricate the sparks from their exile and the Messiah will finally arrive. Now, of course, this is a kind of a Gnosticizing version of the traditional Jewish view that the Messiah is waiting around for enough Jews to um, even keep one Sabbath perfectly. Uh, and then if that happens, when that happens, he will throw off his disguise because uh, he's just hanging around the walls of Rome masquerading as a leper until he hears the, the, the trumpet sound, and then he will uh, liberate his people. Well, this is just kind of a, a Gnostic version of that, and uh, it seems to me, and a really brilliant one. Uh, and so there you do. I mean, what's going to result in this? You will have the, the new heavens and the new earth as they should have been from the beginning. So it is a renewal and a regeneration so that the end will will mirror the beginning, uh, at least as it, it was supposed to begin <laughs> and, uh, uh, and until it got sidetracked. Yeah, and even getting back to the Samesh Pentas, uh, divine attributes, right? You have mm. sort of a similar idea, and I think that's just straight away from Zoroastrian, it's 99 names of Allah, of mm. the God in the Islam, because Quran never articulates them that way. You, you won't find the list of these names in the Quran, uh, at least most of them are not from the Quran. They are from the Hadith literature, from, from the mm. oral, tra oral tradition. And mm. that might be coming from already established practice to recite uh, the, even though in, in Zoroastrianism it's 101 uh, huh. names, but two less in the Islam. Uh, and yes, yeah, so, so, for from my perspective, there is some passages in the Isaiah because Isaiah is sort of a has the Zoroastrian wipe to it, and maybe that's why it was utilized by the Christian, the the book which is loved the most by the Christians, right? The mm. book of Isaiah, mm. uh, like in Isaiah chapter fifty, that, and I will read, "Who is among you?" who fears the Lord, uh, who obeyed the voice of his servant, who walked in darkness and has no light, let him trust the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, you are all fire lighters, girders of the firebrands. And what is interesting that in Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew, Kot uh, Heesh is the Pireithoi, which, which is used by some of the Greeks, like Strabo is used to designate the Magi, the, the Zoroastrian priests. Maybe it's just a co coincidence, but I don't know. But what do you think, what is the most obvious kind of uh, passages in Bible you can pinpoint, which, uh, which would suggest Zoroastrian provenance? Uh, well, the um, possibly the Ezekiel 
uh, valley of the dry bones, but it's hard to know whether that's predicting a literal resurrection or is just saying it's like uh, restoring Israel will be as if the dead returned. I, I don't know. But in the so-called uh, Isaiah apocalypse, which I think is in the 20s, uh, it says uh, their dead will, I don't know, not return, but your dead will live. And uh, in Daniel, which uh, is certainly late enough to, to know Zoroastrianism, it says that the, the righteous dead will shine like stars in the firmament. Uh, and uh, that, that any image like that, it, it may be obvious, it, it could be... Uh, it have occurred to people independently, but you do have to start suspecting that, uh, especially since uh, you've got so much of it in uh, in Gnosticism, which is ultimately in the same general neighborhood. Uh, the uh, well, the virgin birth business. We usually think that that uh, comes from Greek pagan mythology, and it might. Uh, though a lot of those births are miraculous, but in another way, uh, like the, the the mother is not a virgin, like Alexander's mother or Plato's mother or whatever, or the Buddha's mother. Uh, but um, the, uh, the uh, virginal idea, it makes a lot of sense. It makes natural sense in Zoroastrianism because of the... the uh, like you can't just have a, a descendant of Zoroaster. You, you that that would imply that the the holiness or whatever it lessens as it's transmitted. Uh, but if you have essentially Zoroaster himself returning uh, again and again, in effect, that means you got the purity of the spiritual power. Um, the light of the world business in the the gospel of john and in uh, matthew oddly enough which sounds even more gnostic where it says you are the light of the world you collectively uh that struck me as kind of gnostic uh the um but for jesus to be the the light of the world in um uh, and John, I mean, you, you definitely got this big light versus darkness thing throughout John, um, that uh, the uh, light shone in darkness, the darkness has not either comprehended it or snuffed it out, nobody knows, uh, and uh, the, the light uh, shines in darkness, uh, men love darkness and refuse to come to the light because their deeds were evil. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I, I admit it's a fairly obvious metaphor, uh, but um, you find it equally at Qumran, and there's even more similarity to Zoroastrianism there. Uh, with the overt predestination and uh, the uh, the uh, complex angelology and so on, where the, the the initiates had to memorize lists of secret names of the angels, why why would that be? Well, it seems to me obvious they expected a post-mortem ascent into heaven and you had to give the password at the checkpoint. Uh, surely that's uh, what it was. Raymond Brown used to say, well, let's not be too quick to say that, uh, to implicate uh, the Gospel of John in Gnosticism. After all, much the same stuff is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And of course, Bultmann's response is, yeah, but that's Gnostic too. And I, I think maybe he was right about that. Uh, it, it all seems to be, I mean, it's a small neighborhood, all things considered. And and if you can find likely Buddhist influences on uh, Judaism, monastic Judaism and Christ, early Christianity, which you can, uh, this shouldn't pose any problem. Uh, even the, the Gnostic emanationism, that uh, almost has to come from Neoplatonism. Uh, and uh, and and 
as as one scholar put it, Gnosticism seems to be uh, Platonism run riot. Well, yeah, and uh, I think it is so significant uh, that in the Nag Hammadi texts, you have smoking gun evidence for virtually all the, the Gnostic origin theories. Was it mutated from Zoroastrianism? Well, what do you know? You've got Zostrianos. Uh, you, you have um, the Apocalypse of Adam, which is, is plainly a Zoroastrian apocalypse with Jesus tacked on as the latest of the illuminators uh, who come to the water and so on. Uh, it, was Gnosticism Platonism? Well, just so happens we have pieces of, of uh, Plato's Republic among the Nag Hammadi texts. Was it related to Hermeticism? Well, sure enough, we've got two new Hermetic texts in Nag Hammadi. Uh, does it, was it pre-Christian Gnosticism? Well, you've got all these things attributed to Seth and Melchizedek, not Christian apostles. It's like, what a gold mine for uh, theories of syncretistic origins. And as far as I can tell, the great motivation for people to deny that is that they want to hermetically seal off Christian origins uh, from any pollution by other religious systems, because if they don't, uh, then, well, it's like uh, Paul Tillich said in his book, What is Religion? Religious people don't like to be just one more of a bunch of things in a category. That implies it's man-made. It's good views, not good news, as the slogan goes. Uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So any of those pagan things, uh, they must have been uh, false stuff or satanic counterfeits uh, and it, boy it's a it's a tragedy how apologetics has so long warped a history of religion scholarship and still does uh, see John, uh, Jonathan Z Smith yeah I pretty much agree that yeah I, I also wanted to ask about them. I think there is a strong correlation between the ritual purity laws, right? Because it seems like Judaism, Islam, Mandeanism, and eventually Zoroastrianism, all religion obsessed with the ritual purity. At least they would have some uh, sort of uh, concepts, theological concepts for that. And uh, what do you think about that? Do you think yeah, that you know? I, I think that is true. And the, the dead giveaway is that uh, I, Jesus says, uh, I've given you power over the, the uh, powers of the enemy. You can tread on snakes and scorpions and uh, you won't be harmed. And then, of course, the creeping things, et cetera, that are off limits. Uh, why? Uh, and, and why is anything off limits? As uh, uh, Mary Douglas points out in The Abominations of Leviticus, the, the kosher laws are based on the, the ancient Jewish taxonomy that, uh, for instance, you couldn't eat pork because to qualify as legitimate edible livestock, an animal had to have cloven hooves and had to chew the cud. And Porky Pig doesn't do both. He's got the hooves, but not the, 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 the multiple stomachs. And lobsters, up, oh, nope, can't eat those because they're not true fish. They, they don't swim at, with fins. They crawl along. Oh, sorry, Charlie Tuna, you're okay, but uh, uh, so why did God create these things? I mean, it's the things that defy God's neat categories of creation. Why did he create them? He didn't. 
It, it was Ahriman, uh, which is explicit in Zoroastrianism. And, and this can only, I think, be found in Judaism as a result of borrowing from Zoroastrianism. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. problem solved, in my opinion. You have like cer certain uh, lists of Ahrimanic animals and Sephantic, the more better one. And it is, there you the, go. The, yeah, yeah, the list is different across the traditions, obviously. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I myself ha <laughs> had some weird speculation about the Quran that it might coming from the Buddhism, the idea of the prohibition of the pork. Uh, because how how it it expressed in Arabic text the um, ambiguity resigns as as you know that in Theravada school uh, you are allowed to eat meat uh, and uh, obviously pork because it's a major diet for the East Asian countries and uh, how it's explained there is the passage in one of the suttas in, in the Buddhism where. Uh, Buddha was fed by his close associate. Uh, I don't remember exactly the name of his, uh, who, who was a blacksmith, and he prepared the dish for him. And this dish, uh, the title of it was the Sukara Madawa. And there is a debate uh, about this, what exactly does it mean? The Sukara, the both schools, both Mahayana and Theravada, agree that it refers to the pig or pork stemming from protein the european su or sue that's how you get the swine in in english it's just the same word. uh yeah but the second word of this compound uh, madawa they disagree uh madawa means something either something trampled or something soft and Theravada takes takes it as a th takes this combination as a soft tender pork in that case Buddha like it, it's gonna be testimony that the Buddha ate <laughs> meat it, it was the allowed practice but uh, Mahayana takes that as a, some something trampled by the pig in, in that case it would be the some sort of a tr truffles, uh, yeah, sort, of a, sort of a mushrooms, and he was poisoned by the by the mushrooms contained in in, in the dish. But uh, yeah, in, in the Quran you have the the prohibition that hurmat alaykum lahmul hinzir, and this lahmul hinzir you can translate as the literally flesh of the swine, meaning the meat of the swine or the food of the swine because lehem is uh, polysemantic uh, across the semitic languages it has like the main meaning designated for the food generally and uh, secondary one depending on what type of a uh, cultural community you're belonging to obviously if you're a nomad that would be associated with the meat in arabic for example but in Hebrew, in more sedentary culture, in Aramaic, it does signify bread. That's how you have this battle, uh, Beit Lehem, right? The, mm. Mm. And in, in some dialects, in Sakotri Arabic, it's from the one of the islands, uh, which is south to the, to the Yemen. Uh, they, they have this uh, particular verb designating fish for for the obvious reason because in in the island the the main diet would be consisting of the fish so you have mm. even the similar kind of a it's weird because it's even even similar ambiguity is preserved in the text of the quran but there's a whole debate about the khanzir also this pig in arabic means khanzir and it's quite different from the Hebrew, which is Hazir, without the noon, at the second mm -hmm. position. And you have the repetition of this exact word in Enochian literature, in Ethiopic Enoch, this Hanzir, mm -hmm. when animal apocalypse is described, mm -hmm. when Enoch envisioned this weird, uh, I don't know how to call it, angelic beings with a, 
uh, with the appearance of different animals and they represent different tribes or generations on earth and uh, what is fascinating that in Yenok this Hanzir appears at the same time in the same passage with a swine so it can be swine in, in huh. that case uh, and, huh. in, in, and I don't remember what exactly the word uh, say it or something like but I'm not, not gonna say it because I'm not sure but uh, yeah that's the, the the debates are heated uh, about these things but for me i i agree with you that it's most probably from zoroastrianism you know about the buddha and the pork one thing that crosses my mind is it possible weren't embarrassed uh, by the buddha eating meat because of the uh, non-discrimination policy for if you're if you're going from house to house uh, begging you like Jesus says uh, eat whatever they set before you there's this story of the venerable Pendola was uh, going from house to house and he goes to the house of a leper who starts to put something in the bowl and his thumb falls off into it and Pindola says, I am not discriminating. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's the, uh, purposely disgusting to, to say, yeah, here's the extreme case. Uh, is, I mean, is, is that, does that depend upon uh, a more advanced non-dualist sort of a thing than, than could possibly have gone on during the time of the Buddha, if there was a time of the Buddha? Well, I think it's just connected to the general interpretation of ahimsa between because between the schools there is a different ideal stance right in, in theravada it's more like well it's okay if uh, the laity gives the the food as the alms to the to the monks but uh, if, if they only have pig to offer then it's okay for the monk to take it Mm. Uh, but mm. it's strictly prohibited in Mahayana to, to even discuss things like that because, well, in Mahayana you have very strict uh, attitude towards mm, towards the prohibition of any kind of uh, killings of the animals. That's why you have the, the special utensils which mm. for the monks which allow them to gently put away animals from their own bodies so not to harm them and mm. uh, you you may wonder wh whether there is a strong parallels to the to the hajj to the muslim pilgrimage right when uh, it is strictly prohibited to kill the animals during the state of ikhram oh i didn't when... know that hmm. oh you didn't you... yeah that's mm. that's almost the main thing that even if you are killing the oh. insects you must repay uh with a with a food for the poor people because huh. it it violate the it would violate the laws and there's a lot of weird parallels between the the, the buddhism in, in the muslim hajj one of them is also that uh, women are are prohibited during the hajj to have a veil wailing which is would be such a weird thing right because the, the whole islam are all about the wailing of the women that it's hmm. kind of a represent a representation of the modesty of the women but during this festivity this seems to be like where we're there must be uh divine fervor to it women's are prohibited to wear the veil and that's amazing yeah of all times and wow. also there is a hadith which speaks that muhammad prohibited wearing the uh, the shoes the shoes are also prohibited during hajj which may indicate the sort of a closing of the buddhist monk hmm. uh, as far as i know it's also pro this prohibition also stands for the both buddhist schools uh they're not allowed to wear shoes i mean the the monks mm -hmm. and so on 
but uh, I'm just pulling it out of my head. <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> no, very interesting. But even speaking about Zoroastrianism, I think there was a strong mm, interconnectivity between more kind of a Western, geographically Western Zoro uh, B Buddhist schools, uh, which unfortunately hasn't survived till this day. I, by that, I mean what, what was there in Bactria, in Afghanistan, was also called as the Greco Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, they find out some statues of the Buddha, uh, which are placed on the platform, but you have sort of engravings on this platform depicting the Zoroastrian fiery temples. And mm. uh, that's, that must be explained somehow, I guess. And uh, even there was some revolutionary discoveries in terms of a... Mm, this particular Buddhist school, which was present in Afghanistan, I don't remember. It's it's part of the what is called pure land Buddhism. Oh, uh, but but there is a specific title to it, and they weren't that uh, peaceful <laughs> as the Mahayanists. Uh, uh, there's some indication in the text suggesting that uh, it's okay for the for the ruler to impose this dr dr almost draconian type of the law. The beheadings were allowed and so on. And uh, even during the historical period when the Muslims uh, pour, poured out into, the, into those regions, it's the uh, mi middle of the 8th and the late 8th century, there were battles between the Buddhists and Buddhists. There's, there's some reports that the Buddhists are beheaded some Muslims. And that would be very, I mean, not in line with what we know as a Buddhism in a general sense today. But I guess it was not so uh, back at the time. But what's the. <laughs> Wow, uh, haven't there been, I think, uh, Buddhist wars in Sri Lanka over possession of copies of scripture? Something that seems yeah. crazy, but I think that's what I heard. Yeah, unfortunately, this it's it's uh, understudied uh, that this particular tradition. It's, it's just recent phenomena to study this and some of. Uh, historical memories are destroyed about this mm. uh, the, the great uh, statues of uh, of the buddha in bamyan uh, which mm. were devastated by the taliban so mm. but uh, i guess there are some strong parallels to that and that's the specific point of uh, there's a great article i had i had a translation of it uh, on my website called The Buddhist Influence on Early Islam by the Marcus Gross. And he's a part of this German Inara school, which we discussed previously. Mm -hmm. He elaborates on that. Yeah. Wonderful. And let's just take some questions from the audience, hmm. if you don't mind. Oh, no. Really? I mean, Mandeanism have a different split interpretation of Jesus between the false Messiah and the book Messiah. Not exactly one-to-one -one comparison, though, but it's not Manichaeanism exclusive. I have to show my ignorance. I'm not uh, familiar with the idea of the book Messiah. Haven't you heard? Because I recently was on podcast on the Messianic Noahide channel. The guy is sort of a Sabbatean Jew who who thinks that the Quran itself is a sort of a Noahide uh, compliant book uh, dedicated to preach to the Manichaean audience. And uh, he elaborated that in Judaism, at least in his own tradition, they had the idea that there, there was a two Jesus, the, the wicked uh, magician Jesus, and the Jesus of Nazareth, and they 
both got mixed together. And you wow, that's them. I've never heard that. That's fascinating. And that's, I think, exactly what is happening in Mandeanism because they have this wicked Jesus, uh, which they hate, and they mm. have a sort of a Jesus like figure, but it's they're using their own Mandean terms for, for him, like Uthra and uh, sort of a, another title. Mm. And uh, the stories about this person are strikingly similar to the Jesus of Nazareth. So maybe maybe there what? was a, some sort of a similar tradition going on. But I just read several books on Mandeanism. Nobody mentioned <laughs> that. Uh, I was looking for little... Uh, uh, gems like that, but nobody, uh, none of these authors knew about it or thought it was worth telling if they did. That's fascinating. But it's uh, it's very sad what happened to them. So many just dispersed across the globe because of the ISIS. Mm. And it's, it's still a persecuted minority, mm. especially in the whole Shia-Sunni debate. And uh, they, they won't even care about the non-Muslims. They don't care about the Muslims who are, had a different views on the political stance mm. of the imam, but about the non-Muslims, they're just zimis. And it, Buddhism technically became heterodox and deviant from the Hinduism of Vedas, Upanishads, and the Puranas and other texts. Buddhism is pretty, pretty much break away from Hinduism like Christianity breaks from the Judaism. What do you uh, think? Yes, uh, that's true, but there's a, a really interesting difference in that, uh, like, I think Buddhism would be considered a seventh school of Hinduism if they had uh, not rejected Hindu scripture, uh, and uh, which they did, uh, and... Uh, uh, but other and the same thing with Jainism, so similar to some Kaya Hinduism and uh, types of yoga, but uh, they don't accept uh, the Vedas, the Upanishads, and so on. Uh, it, it's kind of a shame because a lot of the uh, common priests liked what the uh, Upanishadic sages had to say, and they managed to read it into the Vedas, just like Christians read Jesus into the Old Testament. So they could have gone that way uh, with Buddhism too, I'm guessing, but didn't happen that way. Well, in Christianity, there was a similar attempt to decouple from the traditional scripture, namely Marcionite Christianity, uh, where he said, look, let's face it, this book uh, has nothing to do with with our savior. It's not a bad book. Uh, he wasn't an anti-Semite or even anti-Jewish. Uh, but he said, look, that's not our religion. Jesus came to start something radically new and his idiot disciples couldn't grasp that and, and uh, mix the two religions. And uh, that's what Marcionites figured Catholics were doing too by insisting on retaining the Old Testament. He says, no, you're just muddying the waters. And uh, so Buddhism felt a, a total break with canonical scripture was uh, was necessary, but you, you're certainly right in the big picture. Uh, Buddhism, it, it does emerge from uh, the different types of Hinduism, much as Christianity eventually separated off uh, from, uh, from Judaism and other influences. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, when you mentioned Marcion, I just recently have some research and Manichaeanism, it seems likely this, there was a big rivalry between the two of those two traditions. Hmm. I, I remember reading some Stephen Hewler stuff. I, I don't know whether you know him. But oh, yes. Uh -huh. about, the, mm, about the Acts of Archelaus, which is the mm, one of the major Latin works dedicated to refuting the Manichaeans. And he thinks that this document itself is a remnant of Marcionism. So it's, it's basically a treatise written by the Marcionites against the Manichaeans. And you definitely have that in Kurdish 
money codex it's it's just a little book uh it's just as far as i know it was a big coincidence how 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 it was uh, got discovered but it's written in greek and in there you can see that the money discussing theological issues with a, a nazarean hmm. and that brings my attention because christians themselves in the quran are uh, referred to as the nasara but uh well there's some some sort of a dialogue between this nazarene and money and nazarene asks the money who is your god and money answers my god is the judge and this nazarene reply that how can it be that uh you are following the god who is the judge he can't be merciful and that's i think just a straight away reference to the marcionites so some marcionite priests i mm -hmm. i guess because it, it, it was their kind of a thing to distinguish between this just god and the that's right god. yeah not evil but uh just kind of a rough customer but uh but just yeah that's right who else said that yeah, yeah. Mm. point well taken the buddhists claim to have converted the kambojas whose name is littered throughout the cyrus family kambaisis kambojas ah is also lexicon for omniscient omnipresence omni omnipotence and buddhism expresses since pali canon to mahayana and vajrayana to be deathlessness three gates of liberation in chinese schools and ten ox herding well you're so, you're uh, you've gone beyond me there yeah. I, this is Steph fascinating but new to me it's for me it's i ought to be good. asking you the questions yeah alan san is the frequent guest on my channel wow bravo dear dr price can we finally read pharisee as the parsi uh yeah i read this in a book by tw manson a New Testament scholar writing, I guess, in the 30s and 40s, I, I believe. And uh, I've, I, I guess I did read it somewhere else later, but he, yeah, I, I'm amazed. I didn't even think to mention this. Yeah, that uh, when um, Zoroastrianism, as I would say, was sort of imposed upon Jews, um, it was only one faction of Jews who accepted this, the ones called the Pharisees. Uh, and uh, the the others, like the uh, the Sadducees, they're often pictured as, I think in the Talmud, they're even called Epicureans. But uh, they, they're not, uh, they, they don't seem to have been Hellenized particularly, uh, and certainly didn't get their skepticism about an afterlife or angels or anything uh, from uh, Greek philosophy. Uh, and Manson said that these people, the Sadducees, the name uh, they claimed came from Zadokites, the, the Zadokite priests instituted by King David, but that probably uh, the original denotation was the Greek syndikoi or councilmen members of the syndic syndicate uh, so they were called syndics and uh that uh apparently unrelated to the arabic term zindic for heretic but uh who knows uh, i don't uh, but the that these people were advocates of traditional israelite religion to some degree and they they uh, had debates with the pharisees uh, who who didn't call themselves that yet. And they said, where do you get this stuff about resurrection and all of this? Oh, yeah, of course, from the Zoroastrians of Persia. You're not really Jews, you're Parsis, Zoroastrians. 
And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, he wasn't arguing this whole case, uh, but uh, but it seems to me to fit perfectly. And of course, later they they also the the Pharisees didn't like the idea that they were influenced by what they probably considered a pagan religion in retrospect. And so they said, oh, no, no, no. It comes from Perushim, I think it is, separated ones. In other words, Puritans. Uh, and uh, But I uh, can't help thinking Manson was right, that that was an attempt to, to redefine the name. Uh, and uh, so I, I think, yeah, that is very significant, the Parsi sect. Uh, so... And they still call that in India. Yeah. Can you reiterate the syndicoy? Uh, what, what, what was that? Uh, that if you were a member of a syndicate, that now it means a crime syndicate or something, but but it used to simply mean an official council who ran things, like the Sanhedrin, which was a syndicate in the old sense, and Sadducees dominated that. They were the wealthy and powerful ones, so they were the syndicoy in Greek, uh, the councilmen, and, uh, th which exactly describes their function. Uh, but since a lot of them were priests, or should I say most of the high priests were Sadducees, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they uh, probably took the Zadokai thing uh, and, uh, to, to add dignity to their, their, uh, their name, uh, whereas the Pharisees originally were the Parsees, the heretics who, uh, who syncretistically mixed up uh, Persian and Jewish religions. I mean, I don't know, but that makes perfect sense to me, sense yeah. than the usual definitions. I guess it's just another possible etym etymology yeah. for, the, for the Arabic Zindik. But uh, w what I heard because Arabic itself, uh, this particular word, is stemming from Zoroastrian discourses. And in Zoroastrianism, the Zindik is usually referred to Manichaeans, as well as in Arabic literature. And hmm. uh, several suggestions were proposed, but one of them is just misspelling of Zadik, because this upper class of Manichaean uh, society a monk community are, are referred themselves as Zadiks. Mm. Uh, and another that's just the Persian for the people following Zand. And Zand is the commentary on Avestan literature. Mm. And you have the Zand, famous Zand Avesta, uh, mm. even as a part of the like, traditional Orthodox Mazdayasna. Zoroastrianism, which is still with us today. So, yeah, but Syndico, I never, never would suggest such a thing. It's fascinating, to be honest. Mm. But maybe, maybe they, they also had some sort of a, what is called the Council San Sanhedrin. It's yeah. possible. Mm. Because that would be sort of a rivalry to the as already established monarchy in, in the Sasanian realm. So they wouldn't like that the Manichaeans would have their own authority in that case. That's why would, mm. they would refer to them to Sindik. But I, I'm speculating much, I guess. Mm. Church fathers say a man named Buddhas conversed with the apostles in Jerusalem with the four Indian books and was persecuted to Persia. Scholars have noted first century Man Mand, I guess, Mandian establishment in Judea and Persia. Uh, well, uh, the um, he's probably thinking of Clement of Alexandria, who spoke of Buddha, and, uh, and I've, I've, he's apparently reliable on that because we hear that King Ashoka or Ashoka, however you say it, uh, sent um, Buddhist missionaries who were uh, healers uh, into Egypt and Syria in the second century BCE. And this led uh, Christian Lintner and Michael Lockwood and uh, others to say, yeah, the 
the Therapeutae of, uh, of Philo were the same as the Theravadins uh, that uh, the King Ahsoka would have sent, and that this is suddenly uh, where Jewish monasticism comes from. Uh, could they have, was it uh, Judaized um, Theravada Buddhism? Uh, and and it sounds kind of crazy, but uh, that just means it's an unaccustomed idea. Uh, who knows? Uh, and in fact, uh, oh, um, uh, and uh, like Eusebius believed that the that uh, the Therapeutae were Christians, and that Philo was a Christian, and that he met Simon Peter. I don't know where he got that, but. Uh, Holy mackerel, what does it mean that anybody even thought that? What led them to believe it? I mean, something like uh, Jesus says, uh, wherever the vultures are gathered, there the body is, or where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, I, I just love all of these odd little uh, loose ends that history has left us. Uh, as to Mandeans being that old, I think they were, um, but it gets... Uh, I guess that has to do with whether you think they really did have a historical connection with John the Baptist, as they claim. Uh, I I think they did. I think that's correct. There's no uh, there's no way that uh, you. I mean, we know that there were John the Baptist sectarians even in the second and maybe third century, who held that John had been the Messiah and expressly not Jesus. And here we have this uh, this somewhat later attested sect that said the same thing, and and it's so odd for anybody else to come up with that. Oh yeah, your Jesus is a false prophet. John is the real thing. Who else would say that? In fact, some say that the Mandeans claimed the John connection just to slip under the the rubric of the people of the book. Uh, to, so, so Muslim authorities would would tolerate them. That that's impossible, though, because Jesus is prominent as the Messiah in the Quran. I mean, there's no way you're gonna <laughs> uh, choose. Uh, you're gonna fabricate a, a connection with John to denigrate Jesus. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's just continue. I just had some ideas, but I think it's too weird. Um, <laughs> oh, nothing's too weird for me. And this is connection with this uh, Terebinthus person. Church fathers say that Buddha was also known as Terebinthus and claimed to have been born from a virgin. They say one of his books was titled, which would make it the earliest. It would be great, Daniel, if you pinpoint what who who is the author of this, who, who actually said it. Well, the Terebinthus thing probably refers to the Bodhi tree, right? Yeah, uh, Terebinthus tree was sacred to Persians, and Alexander was made to eat Terebinthus tree at the Cyrus tomb. The Persian Arabic name for the Terebinth is Bhutan. Oh, Which, what do you know? What do you know? Fascinating. You got very erudite listeners. Wow. Cyril of Jerusalem, Socrates, Scholasticus, Epiphanius, Sudes, all mentioned a man named Terebinthus, who was also known as the Buddhist, conversed with the apostle in Jerusalem with the four Indian books. The Vedas, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, of course, the Buddha wouldn't have been interested in that, but what the heck, uh, it's just a yeah. minor glitch. That That's fascinating. <laughs> I gotta look that up. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But the last question I wanted to ask about the apocalypse itself, because I think the unifying factor between Zoroastrianism some non-orthodox form of Judaism, Islam, definitely, if we look into the Quran uh, and uh, New Testament, the Christianity is the idea that uh, 
at the end time there is gonna be some sort of a fire inflammating the whole universe and uh, do you do you, do you think that what is the oldest you can get from four of this is the zoroastrianism would be the oldest one to propose this idea or maybe just universal type of thing well, I've heard the uh, universal conflagration thing that appears in, uh, I think it's Second Peter. It was just, don't you know that the elements themselves will be dissolved in fire and all that? I've heard that ascribed to Stoic influence, since they believed that uh, the world would be destroyed and then repeated, but destroyed by fire. Um I don't know enough about Zoroastrian eschatology, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, though, by, oh, that reminds me, I thought this, you know, this thing about the, uh, the, the kosher laws being based on Zoroastrianism, I, I thought that for years. And then just recently, I was reading an old book about Zoroastrian eschatology, and son of a gun, the author said the same thing. And I said, okay, great minds think alike. But anyway, um, the, uh, um, the, um, Oh, geez, I've lost track of the, uh, you mean the, the, the oldest eschatology with a fiery end of the universe. Uh, I was just going to say it might be stoicism, but again, I don't know how to oh. specifically date. And I think even the Heraclitus, yeah, he proposed something like that. Yeah, everything is made of fire, though I, get, I have read that... Uh, he is too soon linked with Thales and the others who came up with an origin from one still extant element. And that what uh, Heraclitus really was saying was, it's like the dancing flames of a fire that, uh, that the Lagos cr uh, causes measure in the universe uh, and and so on uh, and that he wasn't necessarily saying it, it emerged from fire but again I'm no historian of philosophy but uh, uh, that surprised me to read it years ago um, yeah even the idea that I don't know how to describe it but in Islam there's the idea that this genies are made out of the fire so there is mm. sort of a gradation of beings and uh, that, that that's precisely why the iblis uh, rejected venerating the adam because he was made out of the fire but adam made out of the clay well how how does that fit with where allah says i will fill the pit of hell with jinn and men i mean they're just going home uh, in that case aren't they uh, Jins, yeah. But I myself, I don't know, there's a, such a weird, I think that's a sort of an anti jude anti yahwist kind of a stuff. Because in, in the Old Testament, you see that the Yahweh is also certainly identified with a fire. He's being identified like your Lord is the cons I mean, Lord is spelled yod he is the mm -hmm. consuming fire. So maybe mm. there is sort of a anti-Jewish passage here. Mm. But because Iblis, yeah, it would be the right thing to do, uh, obviously, if we are dealing with the Quran being Gnostic in origin. Mm. And you, you won't find uh, that striking, right? Why, why do you not find any reference to the Tetragrammaton in the in the Islam, well, Islam has its own tetragrammaton, right? Muhammad, Mim, Ha, Mim, Dal, in that oh. case, but in the Sufi tradition, at least. Hmm. But other than that, even the how the Old Testament prophets are spelled, it seems like they are washing away the name of the of the Yahweh from from their names. That's why Isa spell spelled differently, not Yeshua, not the. Hmm. Not with a mm. yeah. Mm. Wow. 
But other than that, I guess it's, it's a big mystery. But uh, and as, as I see, there's no more questions. So thank you, Dr. Price, uh, and to our wonderful audience for, mm. for fantastic discussion on the influence. Yeah, amazing the stuff. Uh, yeah, what a privilege to learn from you and them. I hope our conversation has sparked further curiosity for the audience. Thank you again, and I look forward to our future discussion. You bet. Uh, you bet. Uh, yeah. Thanks a bunch. Go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs>